Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, sorry to be about to introduce an another rather somber note into what has uh, otherwise been uh, a very enjoyable evening. Uh, let me start with Sir Robert Menzies. He was a liberal conservative, an individualist, and a believer in middle-class virtues of ambition, family loyalty, and self-reliance. In all of these respects, Menzies was a man of his time, much in the same mold uh, as contemporary European statesmen such as Harold Macmillan in Britain and Konrad Adenauer in Germany. I was born the year before Menzies uh, began his second premiership. Now, in my adult life, there have been radical changes in our world which have undermined many of the values that Menzies and his contemporaries held dear. The West's share of the world's resources and output, which Menzies took as a given, has been much reduced. Today, uh, Western economies are being challenged by low-wage economies and the shortening of their technological lead. We face problems of faltering growth, relative economic decline, uh, redundant skills, and capricious patterns of inequality. Uh, at the same time, there has been a dramatic rise in public demands on the state uh, as the provider of amenities, uh, as a guarantor of minimum standards of economic security, and as the regulator of an ever-widening range of human activity. Um, coercion is the ordinary language of the state. When we transfer responsibility for our well-being from ourselves to the state, we invite a larger measure of coercion and a more authoritarian style of government. Uh, in many ways, therefore, the intellectual goalposts have shifted uh, since uh, Menzies was alive. Uh, it is a lot more difficult to be a liberal conservative and individualist in modern conditions than it was in his day. Uh, perhaps the most striking manifestation of these changes in our outlook has been the response of most states, not just in Victoria, but across the world, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I'm not going to embark uh, on a denunciation uh, of lockdowns uh, as a way of dealing with COVID-19, although I am on record as objecting strongly to them for a mixture of principled and pragmatic reasons. Tonight, I am concerned with a different question, namely what this particular episode in our history tells us about current attitudes to the state and personal liberty. On that larger canvas, lockdowns are only the latest and most spectacular illustration of a wider tendency in our societies. At the root of the political problems generated uh, by the pandemic, was the public's attitude to risk and to the state. Uh, people have a remarkable degree of confidence in the capacity of the state to contain risk and to ward off misfortune. An earlier generation regarded natural catastrophes as only marginally amenable to state action. The Spanish flu pandemic uh, of 1918 to 1921 uh, is the event most closely comparable to the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 to 2021. Uh, it's estimated to have killed 200,000 people in the United Kingdom alone uh, at a time when the population was about two-thirds of what it is now. Uh, estimates of global mortality range from 20 to 100 million people at a time when the world's population was only about a sixth of what it is now. Australia was largely protected by distance and quarantine uh, from the worst of the Spanish flu pandemic. But in Europe, 
uh, where Spanish flu took a much heavier toll, governments uh, took no special steps to curtail its transmission, apart from isolating known infected persons, uh, which had been the classic response uh, to epidemic disease from time immemorial. The closely related pathogens behind Asiatic flu in 1957 and Hong Kong flu in 1968 had an infection rate roughly comparable uh, to that of COVID-19, but a mortality rate which was slightly lower. No special steps were taken to control transmission. In the US and the UK, a deliberate decision was made not to take such steps because of the disruptive consequences that they would have for the life of the nation. Nobody criticized that approach. COVID-19 is a more infectious pathogen than Spanish flu, but it is significantly uh, less mortal. It's also a great deal easier to deal with because in the main, it affects those who are over 65 or suffering from one of a number uh, of pre-existing but readily identifiable clinical conditions, uh, almost all connected with the respiratory system. A high proportion of these people are economically inactive, and they can be encouraged uh, to shield themselves. Governments could have worked with the natural instincts of humans for self-preservation and allowed the vulnerable category to get on the vulnerable, less vulnerable categories to get on with their lives while the state concentrated on the protection of those who were vulnerable. By comparison, Spanish flu was a great deal more difficult to deal with because of its devastating impact on healthy people under the age of 50. Nonetheless, in 2020, Britain, in common with Australia, and almost all Western countries ordered an indiscriminate lockdown uh, of the whole population, healthy or sick, young or old, something which had never been done before uh, in the history of mankind's response to disease anywhere. Now, these measures enjoyed substantial public support. Uh, in Melbourne, uh, lockdown was enforced with a brutality uh, unequaled in liberal countries. Uh, but the Lowy Institute poll conducted in 2021 found that 84% of Australians thought that their government had handled it uh, either very well or fairly well. Uh, it seems from the same polls that Australians thought even better of New Zealand's approach with 91% in favor. So in the intervening century, between COVID-19 and Spanish flu, something radically changed in our collective output. Two things in particular have changed. One is that we expect more of the state and are less inclined to accept that there are limits to what it can or should do. The other is that we are no longer willing to accept risks which have always been inherent in life itself. Human beings have, after all, lived with epidemic disease from the beginning of time. Uh, COVID-19 is a relatively serious epidemic, but historically it's well within the range of health risks which are inseparable from ordinary existence. Uh, with, uh, inseparable, in other words, from risks, uh, which human beings have always had to live with. Uh, in Europe, bubonic plague, smallpox, cholera, tuberculosis were all much more serious in their time. Worldwide, the list of comparable or worse epidemics is substantially longer. It's certainly within the broad range of diseases with which we have to expect to live in future. So the change is in ourselves and not in the nature or severity of the risks that we face. Epidemic disease is a particularly clear example of the kind of risks from which we crave protection from the state, uh, although it is inherent in life itself. But there are many other risks 
financial loss, economic insecurity, crime, sexual violence and abuse, sickness, accidental injury. The quest for state protection against every, ever wider categories of risk is a very powerful instinct of modern life. Uh, it is not, however, irrational. In some ways, it's a natural response to the remarkable increase in the technical competence of mankind since the middle of the 19th century, which has greatly increased the range of things that the state can do. As a result, we have inordinately high expectations of the state. For all perils, there must be a governmental solution. If there is none, then that implies a lack of governmental competence. There are few things in life as routine as death. In the midst of life, we are in death, says the Book of Common Prayer. Yet the technical possibilities of modern publicly financed medicine have accustomed us to the idea that except in extreme old age, any death from disease is premature and that all premature disease is avoidable. Starting as a natural event, therefore, death has become a symptom of societal failure. Hence, the demands that we make for intervention by the state. In modern conditions, risk aversion and the fear that goes with it are a standing invitation to authoritarian government. If we hold governments responsible for everything that goes wrong, they will take away our autonomy so that nothing can go wrong. If we demand from the state protection uh, from risks which are inherent in life itself, then the state's measures will necessarily involve the suppression of some part of life itself. The quest for security as at the price of coercion and state intervention is a feature of democratic politics, which was pointed out in the 1830s by the great political scientist Alexis de Tocqueville in his remarkable study of American democracy, a book whose uncanny relevance to modern dilemmas can still take one by surprise after nearly two centuries. De Tocqueville's description of the process can hardly be bettered. What he said was this, the protecting power of the state extends its arm over the whole community. It covers the surface of society with complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate to rise above the crowd. The will of man is not shattered, but it is softened, bent and guided. Men are seldom forced to act, but they are constantly restrained from acting. Such a power does not destroy but it prevents existence. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, and extinguishes. It stupefies a people until each nation is reduced to nothing better than a flock of timid and industrious animals to which the government is the shepherd. Now, by definition, regulation is designed to limit risk by limiting freedom. Governments do this primarily to protect themselves from criticism. During the pandemic, uh, regulations addressed the risk of infection by COVID because governments identified that as the thing that they were most likely to be criticized for. Governments were quite willing to accept considerable collateral damage to mental health resulting from the lockdown and large increases in deaths from cancer ischemic heart disease, and dementia. Why was that? It was because they knew that they were less likely to be criticized for those things. They wouldn't show up uh, on TV screens and the evening news with pictures of long lines of ambulances outside hospitals. They would not appear in daily casualty lists, but they are just as real. A good deal of historical experience suggests that people who are sufficiently frightened will submit to an authoritarian regime 
which offers them security against some real or imagined threat. Historically, the threat has usually been war. In the two world wars of the 20th century, Britain transformed itself into a temporary despotism with substantial public support. Wars, however, are rare. The countries of the West have not faced an existential threat uh, from external enemies uh, since the Second World War. However, the threat to democracy uh, and to its survival is not major disasters like war. It is much more minor perils, which in the nature of things occur more often. The more routine the perils from which we demand protection from the state, the more frequently will those demands arise. If we confer despotic powers on governments to deal with perils which are an ordinary feature of human existence, we are going to end up doing it most of the time. It's because the perils against which we now demand protection from the state are so much more numerous and so much more routine than they were that they are likely to lead to a more fundamental and more durable change in our attitudes to the state. This is, I think, a much more serious problem than war for the future of democracy. In the first of my 2019 BBC REIT lectures, I drew attention to the implications of public aversion to risk for our relationship with the state. I referred to what I called the Hobbesian bargain. The 17th century English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes argued that human beings surrendered their liberty completely, unconditionally, and permanently uh, in, to an absolute ruler in return for security. Hobbes was an apologist for absolute government. In his model of society, the state could do absolutely anything for the purpose of reducing the risks that threaten our well-being uh, other than deliberately killing us. Hobbes' state was an exceedingly unpleasant thing, but he did grasp a profound truth. Most despotisms come into being not because a despot has seized power, but because people willingly surrender their freedoms in return for security. Our culture has always rejected Hobbes' model of society. Intellectually, it still does. But in recent years, it has increasingly tended to act on it. The response to COVID-19 took that tendency a long way further. Now, I could not have imagined when I delivered those lectures in 2019 that my concerns would be so quickly and dramatically vindicated. Until March 2020, it was unthinkable that liberal democracies should confine healthy people to their homes indefinitely, with limited exceptions entirely dependent on the discretion of government ministers. It was unthinkable that a whole population should be subject to criminal penalties for associating with other human beings and answerable to the police for all the most ordinary activities of daily life. When, in early tw February 2020, the European Centre for Disease Control published the pandemic plans of all 28 then members of the EU, including the United Kingdom, not one of those plans envisaged a general lockdown. Not one. Only two mentioned the possibility, only to dismiss it out of hand because of the severe collateral uh, consequences. The two principal plans were those prepared by the United Kingdom Department of Health uh, and by the Robert Koch Institute, which is the standard uh, epidemiological institute advising the government in Germany. Uh, they came to remarkably similar conclusions. The great object, they suggested, would be to enable ordinary life to continue as far as possible. The two main lessons were, first, to avoid indiscriminate measures so that one could concentrate uh, on state, inter state intervention uh, on the vulnerable categories, and secondly, to treat people as grown-ups uh, and go with the grain of human nature 
which would involve avoiding coercion. The published minutes of the Committee of Scientists advising the United Kingdom government show that their advice was on the same lines right up to the announcement of the first lockdown. In the United Kingdom, the man mainly responsible for persuading the government to impose a lockdown was Professor Neil Ferguson, an epidemiological modeler based at Imperial College London. His work was influential both in the UK and elsewhere. In a press interview in February 2021, Professor Ferguson explained what changed their mind. It was the lockdown in China. What he said was this, it's a communist one-party state, we said. We couldn't get away with it in Europe, we thought. And then Italy did it, and we realized we could. Now, it's worth, I think, pausing for a moment to reflect on what that statement meant. It meant that because a lockdown of the entire population appeared to work in a country which was notoriously ind indifferent to individual rights and traditionally treated human beings uh, as mere instruments of state policy, they could, quote, get away with it, unquote, doing the same thing here. Uh, entirely absent from Professor Ferguson's analysis was any conception of the principled reasons why it had hitherto been unthinkable for Western countries to do this. It was unthinkable because it was based uh, on a conception of the state's relationship with its citizens, which was morally repellent, even if it worked, itself a large question. It's not simply the assault on the concept of liberty that matters. It's the particular liberty which has been most obviously discarded, namely the liberty to associate with other human beings. Association with other human beings is not just an optional extra. It's not simply a leisure option. It is fundamental to our humanity. Uh, our emotional relationships, our mental well-being, our economic fortunes, our entire social existence is built upon the ability of people to come together. Historically, the response to an epidemic like this would have been a matter for individuals to make their own risk assessments in the light of their own vulnerabilities and those of the people around them. Sweden, which avoided coercion in favor of sensible advice to vulnerable categories, had a death toll broadly in line with the European average and considerably better than the United Kingdom's. The substitution uh, of a governmental decision applicable to the whole population, irrespective of their individual circumstances, is a most extraordinary development in the history uh, of our society and of other Western societies which have done the same thing. The way that this one-size-fits-all approach has been justified adds to its totalitarian flavor. One argument, certainly in the United Kingdom, was that uniform rules applied to people with different levels of vulnerability were necessary in the name of social solidarity. Well, there are perhaps two kinds of social solidarity. There is the solidarity of mutual support, but there is also a different kind of solidarity, namely the solidarity of intolerant conformism. It is irrational to treat everybody the same when the impact of the problem in, in, in case is very different. The other argument that we heard was that it would be too difficult to enforce rules that differentiated between different people according to their degree of vulnerability. In other words, the rules were couched in indiscriminate terms in order to make life simpler for the police. When conven the con convenience of social control becomes in itself an object of public policy, we are adopting part of the mentality of totalitarianism. Now, all of this marks uh, a very radical change in the relationship between citizens and the state.
The change is summed up in the first question that was asked of the UK Prime Minister when Number 10's daily press conferences were opened up to the public. The question was, is it okay for me to hug my granddaughter? Now, something odd has happened to a society in which people feel that they need to ask the Prime Minister if it's okay to hug their granddaughter. And I would sum up the change in this way. What was previously a right inherent in a free people became dependent on government license. We have come to regard the right to live normal lives as a gift of the state. It's an approach which treats all individuals as instruments of collective policy. And all of this was made possible by fear. Throughout history, fear has been the principal instrument of the authoritarian state. Fear and insecurity were the basis on which Hobbes justified absolute states. And that is what we have been witnessing over the last two years. A senior figure in the UK government told me during the early stages of the pandemic that in his view, the liberal state was an entirely unsuitable setup for a situation like this. What was needed, he said, was something more Napoleonic. That perhaps says it all. At least as serious as the implications for our relations with the state are the implications for our relations with each other. The use of political power as an instrument of mass coercion fueled by public fear is exceptionally corrosive. It's corrosive even perhaps especially when it enjoys majority support. For it tends to be accompanied, as it has been in Britain, and I believe in Australia, by manipulative, manipulative government propaganda and vociferous intolerance of any minority which disagrees. Authoritarian governments fracture the society in which they operate. The pandemic generated distrust, resentment, and mutual hostility among citizens in most countries where lockdowns were imposed. It's widely assumed that this is a phase which will pass when COVID-19 disappears, if it ever does. Now, I'm afraid I think that this is an illusion. We have turned a corner and it will not be easy to go back. I say this for several reasons. The first and most obvious is that governments do not lightly relinquish powers that they have once acquired. In Britain, wartime controls were kept in being for years after the end of the war. Food rationing remained in place in the name of social solidarity until 1952, long after it had disappeared in Germany and in the European countries which Germany had occupied. Regulations requiring people to carry identity cards, which had been introduced in 1940 to control spies and fifth columnists, remained in force until the mid-1950s. This was the social solidarity argument in action. My second reason for pessimism is that I see no reason why politicians should ever want or need to respect basic liberal values if the public is happy uh, to see the back of them. There will be other pandemics. They will provoke the same reaction. But public support for Napoleonic government is not just simply a response to epidemic disease. It's a response to a much more general feeling of insecurity combined with a profound faith in the ability of governments to solve any problem if they throw enough money and talent at it. It's a symptom of a much more general appetite for authoritarian government as the price of security. And it's accentuated by a growing feeling that one sees reflected in countless polls about the strength of modern democracy, that strong governments are efficient. Strong men get things done. They get on with the problem uh, while deliberative assemblies like parliaments 
are just a waste of time and a source of dispute and inefficiency. Now, something of the flavor of this mentality can perhaps be seen in Australia in the decision of the then federal prime minister to assume the powers of five different ministries in addition to those of his own office. He must presumably have believed that a single all-powerful figure was what was needed. The same thinking must, at least in some degree, have been responsible for the suspension of Parliament in Victoria. Historical experience ought to warn us that the idea that strong men get things done is usually wrong. Autocratic government is usually bad government, and there are obvious reasons why that should be so. The concentration of power in the hands of a small number of people and the absence of wider deliberation and scrutiny enable governments to make major decisions on the hoof without proper forethought, planning, or research. Within the government's own ranks, it promotes loyalty at the expense of wisdom, uh, flattery at the expense of objective advice. The want of criticism encourages self-confidence, and self-confidence banishes moderation and restraint. At least in Europe, and particularly in the United Kingdom, all of these vices were in evidence during the pandemic. Now you might say, well, if the public's happy, isn't that democracy in action? I answer that by saying that this is how democracies destroy themselves. Democracies are systems uh, of collective self-government. Now, of course, it's perfectly possible and occasionally necessary for democracies to confer considerable coercive powers on the state without necessarily losing their democratic character. But there is a point beyond which the systematic application of mass coercion is no longer consistent with any notion of collective self-government. The fact that it is difficult to define exactly where that point lies uh, does not mean that it isn't there. A degree of respect for individual autonomy seems to me to be a necessary feature of anything which deserves to be called a democracy. My final reason for believing that we have turned a corner on liberal democracy is perhaps the most fundamental. Uh, Aristotle regarded democracy as inherently, an inherently unstable form of government because it was too easily transformed into despotism by the natural tendency of people to fall for an appealing tyrant. Uh, I think that Aristotle was right about that tendency. It is the reason why some form of authoritarian government has always been the default position of mankind. Nevertheless, most Western democracies have resisted this tendency for something like two centuries and avoided the disintegration which Aristotle regarded as their natural end. What has enabled this to happen is a shared political culture. Governments have immense powers, not just in the field of public health, but generally. These powers have existed for many years. Their existence has been tolerable in a liberal democracy only because of a culture of restraint, proportionality, and balance, which made it unthinkable that they should be used in a despotic manner. It has only ever been culture and convention which prevented governments from adopting a totalitarian model. But culture and convention are fragile. They take years to form, but can be destroyed very quickly. Once you discard them, there is no barrier left. The spell is broken. If something is unthinkable until somebody in authority thinks of it, then the psychological barriers, which have always been our main protection against despotism, have, dan have vanished. There is no inevitability about any future course uh, or a historical trend. But the changes in our political culture seem to me to reflect a very profound change in the public mood, which has been for many years in the making,
uh, and will be many, many years in the unmaking. We are, I'm afraid, entering into a Hobbesian world, the enormity of which has not yet dawned on our people. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.